All right, so how long have you been dancing and do you primarily lead or follow? Okay, um, so I've been dancing blues and swing for 10 years, which seems incredible. Um, and uh, I've been dancing anything, so like musical theater or like child ballet for 24 years, for 24 years. Any dance is that one. Um, and I primarily follow, but I do lead a bit. Cool. Three questions. Why do you dance? Why did you start? And what has kept you coming back? So I wrote down some thoughts about this because there are so many. Um, I dance I dance for a lot of reasons. Um, I think the most straightforward reason is that it feels really cool to, to have the music, like, come out of you. Like, basically feel like you are the music and and it's moving you and like you're you're playing with the rhythms or like you're expressing the feelings like it just feels really cool whether you're by yourself with a partner or whatever dance it is like it feels great um i was trying to remember what why i started i know how i started like i uh i had a friend through swing dancing who was like come to this blues weekend and i was like what's that and I went with her and I remember liking it enough to keep doing it, but I was trying to remember like what about it I kept me coming back. I think I think it was a few things. I think part of it was sort of the vibe that it had is like we're drinking, we're at a party, like we're really cool. This is like what cool kids do and like we're being kind of bad. So so I think that that part of it appealed to me and uh, and the booty shaking definitely appealed to me, definitely. Um, and then uh, what keeps me coming back is a ton of things. Um, I, I used to do a lot of acting uh, and would, you know, get to do characters and get out my expression that way, and I don't do that anymore, mostly because I dance all the time, but, um, but I still get to do that through this. Um, the wonderful range of musical styles that blues has lets you express a huge range of emotions and because you do performances you can also take on characters so i i have a big expressive outlet um through dance that i really enjoy um and that also extends to partner dancing too because you know you get to have all these like fun playful interesting cool rhythms and feelings that you express with a partner and that's super, super cool the improvisational element is awesome because you like ne no two dances are exactly alike. Even when they're choreographed, <laughs> they are still still not exactly alike every time. Um, uh, I really like the show offery of blues dancing. The like friendly competition is like really cool. I think that's great. Um, also for blues specifically, I find it. And it's, it's, I find it extremely intellectually interesting and challenging because we have we have a dance that is not well documented visually, um, and we're still sort of uncovering what what it looked like back in the day. And we have a lot of like secondary sources and a lot of you know footage of what dances descended from the blues or in a similar like genre to the blues look like, but it's like sort of a fun mystery to like find all these old clips and and like the search for the the roots of the dance are really fun and then that combined with like this is still a dance that we're doing today and like we don't just do a thing that we saw someone else do like it's still a creative art and we're still making up our own things but how do we how do we embody the the, the true heart of the dance um and, and free ourselves up for creativity at the same time. Like, that's a super fun, um, like, intellectual and emotional activity for me. So I really dig that. Also, I still like the booty shaking. <laughs> still like it. Still okay. <laughs> I think that's it. Oh, oh, there were two other things. I'm glad I took notes. Um, two other things that blues gives me in particular is um, I, uh, I'm a tiny little lady, and uh, there are not many times in my life where I feel powerful and for whatever reason blues makes me feel not only powerful but like like powerful in my body like I like feel like I do have a big butt and like I can shake my stuff even though I'm like a twig like it's I like that about it too 
That's really it. That's it. That's it. Really this time. Cool. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a lot that's been keeping you coming on back. I see. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Cool. So uh, going on a similar note, how would you describe blues dancing? Um, it depends on who I'm describing it to. Um, if I'm, you know, describing it in a class uh, where I want to, I want to make sure that they know where our dance comes from. I'll do something a little bit more formal, like um, blues is a family of African American based vernacular dances that we do to um, a wide range of styles of blues music, um, and then I'll usually add on what I'll what I'll sell people on which is something like it's a relaxed and super rhythmic dance that you can do by yourself or a partner to blues music. And it's really fun and improvisational. And um, there's a lot of opportunities for uh, partner interaction. So some combination of those things, depending on who I'm speaking with. How does dancing or blues dancing make you feel? Makes me feel awesome. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it makes me feel a wide range of things. Um, I, uh, I actually have a class on like different different uh, moods of blues music, um, and it's everything from you know resilient sadness to joy to aggression to uh, what is it? I'm trying to remember some of the words I used. Um, I didn't say sexy and I didn't say sassy because those are. I feel like those are not, they don't fully represent what, um, what those types of songs actually are expressing. There's some, there was something like, you can't get none, like, bragging type thing, like, it's something like that, like, when it's a sexy song, it's not like, I'm sexy, I'm sexy, it's like, I'm sexy, deal with it, like, it's not, it's not like, I'm bad at words right now, but, you know, um, but yeah, there's a wide range of moods that I enjoy in blues. Two-parter, where do you dance, and how do your experiences with blues dancing vary from one space to another? Um, I have danced in so many places. I have danced in, I'd say mostly in something that resembles either an apartment or a dance studio slash bar. Um, but like I've danced in basements, I've danced in a park, I've danced in a pool, I've danced in like a gigantic ballroom or like the tiniest person's like sweaty apartment. Like it's a lot of different places. Um, and the way that it affects the dance, I'd say the most obvious one is like your physical constraints, um, mostly due to space so like do you have a lot of space to move around or are you in a bar with a bunch of people holding drinks and you don't really have space to move around um and also what is your floor like so are you on like a well polished well kept ballroom floor or are you on concrete or are you like in water i mean the the pool one is probably that that example because that's not like who would think that would be good i mean who would think that would be easy to dance in um but yeah like are you on concrete so Um, like, stickier surfaces are harder to deal with for me, um, but I think the space thing, uh, if, if both you and your partner are, like, know what's happening, the space thing can, I don't think it has to negatively affect affect the dance. I think it can make it awesome. Um, and then also there's, like, sort of the, the more subtle aspects, like the, you know, the vibe of the place, like, is it dimly lit? Like, are people smoking and drinking? Or is it like, we're all dressed up and we're like, it's fancy time? Or like, are we just like super casual in the afternoon? Like, so it that that has that has an effect on the dance, um, as well as sort of like the mood of the of the space and the time. Has blues dancing changed since you first began? And uh, in what ways and what do you think contributes to those changes? Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> so the blues scene has changed a lot uh, since I started dancing. When I started dancing, um, particularly where I was dancing, which was in Pittsburgh around 2004, like er- early 2000s, um, blues dancing 
was not anything rooted in uh, like the African American vernacular in any way. It was what it looked like was sort of a combination of like salsa, West Coast swing, like there was definitely some like stripper pole dance influence in in the Pittsburgh scene. Like it was uh, it was a very ridiculous time. There was a lot of like hair flipping and self dipping going on. Uh, where where I was learning to dance, but um, but yeah, it's uh, it's very different now. Um, I'd say booty shaking's still happening uh, in the current scene, though. And um, there was definitely, at least in the Pittsburgh scene, there was definitely even then um, still a lot of like partner communication, not in like the necessarily good way like we're both listening to each other and having an equal voice it's like followers can do stuff too might not be safe <laughs> stuff that they're recommending but like it was never blues dancing for me I was never told like followers have to just like listen so that's still in common I think um I think the two biggest things that led to the change as far as I can tell um is uh one the uh I suppose breaking off for uh, or growth of the fusion scene, um, because in the in the when I started, there was a very there was a very big argument in the blues scene about the identity of blues dancing. So was blues dancing um, a dance with a history that was having a revival, um, a dance that had an aesthetic to it, or was blues dancing just dancing to slow music? How, whatever slow music you wanted, however you wanted to dance to it. Um, and there's much turmoil, much, much online flame warring over this. Um, but uh, when fusion became its own scene, I think a lot of the people who were looking for that, like, I want to dance to whatever music, whatever way I want to dance it, um, they found their home in the fusion scene, so the blues scene that remained were more the people who were looking for that, like, that dance that is the one with the history and the aesthetic and, and looked a certain way. Um, so I think that was, that was one big thing. And the other big thing, um, I think, was competitions. Um, I think that seeing, seeing people, uh, being judged on criteria that seemed to be the same for, you know, at least the early events that had competitions. I think that helps people uh, codify what the scene defines as the blues aesthetic um, and keep demonstrating it publicly to people and keep talking about it. And, and people want to win stuff. So they're like, well, if I want to win, I have to like do this blues aesthetic thing. So I think, uh, I think those are probably the two biggest, um, biggest contributors to, um, to the changes in the way the dance looks now versus then. How does dancing with different partners impact your experience? Every dance is different. Um, so dancing with, in terms of level, um, I think I have, I have probably I'd say an equally good time like with dancers of lots of different levels, but it is a very different type of good time. When I'm dancing with a beginner, a lot of, of that good time is seeing, even at like a, a less experienced level, seeing how they are feeling the music and like seeing where I can come and meet them, where where they are and sort of draw them out a little bit. Like it, it's a little bit like, hey buddy, like, Want to do, want to do this? Like, like trying to, uh, you know, yeah, draw them out a little bit. Um, or if I'm, if I'm leading, like providing a, a very comfortable structure, but doing stuff that allows my follower to, to move, um, like however they want at a beginner level, but being, being super clear, like you can be over here and like we can shimmy and like, now let's go over here and shimmy, like. Like providing providing enough guidance that they're not like what do I do, um, and then like as we go up in level, the ways that I can express myself become a little bit more complex. Um, like I'm able to successfully communicate 
um, changes on different aspects of the dance that I wouldn't be able to communicate with a beginner because um, it would feel like I'm just, like they're not giving me, uh, they don't know how to listen to the detailed stuff that I would be doing, so it would feel like I wasn't following them, so I wouldn't do that because it would feel like I wasn't following them. Um, and then when you get like super high level, then it's like, super cool and like the fun there is is that what <laughs> what Sean Hershey and I uh like to call Ouija dance when it's like oh did you do that did I do that I think I did that and you both you both think that it was your idea both of you think it was your idea and it's uh it's just this really fun like totally seamless uh creative time and it's uh it's pretty cool um and then even within like each level of dancer, you have totally different styles. Like, um, one of my, this is one thing I love about social dancing is like, even if we're just looking at the top level of leader, like dancing with Damon versus Sean versus Joe Demers versus Andrew Smith, like they are just so, so super different and all really cool. And I like, I like that variety a lot. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd say really the only time I have a, bad time dancing is if someone's pulling me around on the floor like like just like get over here get over here that's the only I think that's the only time I have a bad time or if someone is um being being inappropriate in a way where I can't tell if it's on purpose if I can tell it's on purpose then I could be like please don't do that um and if like they might just be awkward then you have to like be a little more gentle and, uh, yeah. But I'd say those are the only times I have, like, a bad, a bad time dancing. Um, did I cover all the bases there on that one? I think so. Definitely. Okay, great, great, <laughs> great. Your opinion, do men and women experience dancing differently? Oh, this question. Okay, um, so the answer is both yes and no. Um, I feel like all people experience stance differently. So, like, no two people are going to have the exact same experience. Um, but I think that people probably have a lot of experiences in common. Um, but I don't, I don't think it really is going to depend on gender. I think it's going to depend on, like, how, like, what you grew up with, or, like, what your tastes are. Um, the only things I could think of that might, might be affected by gender is the fact that in American society today, there, there is somewhat of a stigma, I shouldn't say somewhat, um, there's a stigma against, like, men dancing for whatever reason, which is, in my opinion, pretty silly, but, uh, I, I think that, maybe when you first begin dancing as a man, you might not be as comfortable just expressing yourself. Um, and that might be because of the stigma, or it might be because when you were younger, there was a stigma, so you didn't learn dancing stuff or do dancing stuff as early. So now as an adult, you don't have as much experience, so you're less comfortable because you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I think that women could have had that experience as well of not being, uh, of not doing movement earlier in life, but I think it's probably less common um, because of our culture. Um, but when it comes to stuff like experiencing people being creepy on you in a dance, like that definitely ha happens to both men and women. Um, experiencing partners who like are totally not listening to you, like that happens to both men and women. Um, being in control in a dance, I think that happens for both men and women. I think, yeah, the only thing I could really think of is the, is the potential stigma on dance in, in mainstream American society for men. Do you feel that either role sets up any particular gender or power dynamic? Nope. Cool. <laughs> I, think, um, I think your skill level uh, sets up your power dynamic. I think that um, because I am a very experienced follow when I am following. I am much more in control than when I'm leading, which is probably seems ironic. But as a leader, I don't feel as free to express myself because I'm not good enough at that role to be able to like 
both listen and contribute my own ideas, I have to like kind of go back and forth between the two. And as a follower, because I'm skilled enough, I, I feel like I have complete freedom of expression um, within the dance. So, nope. <laughs> How would you describe femininity and masculinity? I hate I hate this. I hate this. So, um, I, I have taught in the past, upon request, uh, feminine movement classes. Um, and I made assumptions about what the organizer wanted that to mean based on what people generally associate with femininity. Um, I always, when I taught those classes, um, except maybe probably the first few times when I was still kind of like, feminine movement, like, what? Um, I would say, I do not, I think we should be careful when we say masculine and feminine and think about what we're doing when we ascribe certain um, characteristics being aligned with being a woman or being a man and how that could potentially be damaging. Like, if I am strong, does that mean I'm not a woman? Like, how? That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing to tell people. Um, so I don't really like those terms. Um, when I have taught or seen classes taught about masculine movement versus feminine movement, feminine is usually stuff like round lines, moving your hips, softness, um, like, yeah, like, not straight lines, but like, you know, soften it. Um, there, I saw a class once where it was like, like, looking with your eyes in a different direction from your face. I thought that was an interesting one. But, um, yeah, and then masculine is usually stuff like more focused on chest movement and strong straight lines and like aggressive stuff. And another thing that I think that, another bad thing that talking about masculine and feminine movement does is when people are like, oh, well, I'm a woman, but I want to dance masculinely. You're like, now I'm going to move like a gorilla and like lock up my hips and like not move my body the way is like feels normal. And like when a guy wants to do feminine movement, which is probably like, I haven't seen as many performances that, that have that where I've seen a, a few females doing masculine movement performances. Um, I feel like guys, like, uh, here's a good example, like, when guys, like, follow, in Lindy Hop, I've seen some guys, like, do very, like, you know, like, kind of swishy arms, or, like, try to, like, stick their butt out a lot, and I feel like it causes us to ape each other, instead of moving in a, in a way that has a different flavor, but is still us. So that's another thing I don't like about it. <laughs> do not like it. Next question. <laughs> I don't know you're going to like this one either. <laughs> Sorry. Um, question to ask so I can say these things in public. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you feel you embody any feminine or masculine characteristics when you dance? Well, I've been asked to teach feminine movement classes before because I've been told that I do excellent feminine movement. Um, which the first time someone said to me, I was like, huh, because it wasn't, again, it wasn't something that I was like, I want to be, I want to be a feminine dancer. I was never on my mind, you know, I'm just like moving a way that I feel is nice. Um, so, uh, I must, I must move in a way that is feminine enough to elicit uh, such a request. Um, and I think it's because I do do, um, Particularly my solo movement, I do a lot of um, a lot of like arm arm shapes and like round round arm shapes and like hand stuff, um, which I think is perceived as feminine. And I do um, do a lot of movements where like my hips are kind of accentuated in a big out way versus a like smaller isolated way, which I think is also perceived as feminine. Um, I think those, those are probably the big ones. Um, I feel like booty shaking is, uh, is equally masculine or feminine, so that's probably not part of the, part of that one. Um, in terms of masculine movement, uh, 
That one's hard. That one's harder for me because, like, if I think about like, you know, the I'm gonna move masculine, so I'm gonna be a gorilla. Like, no. Um, but if I think of like Dexter or Damon, I feel like there's there are definitely movement styles in common that we do. And actually, Damon does a lot of like, like hand hand stuff that um, I think on another body might be described as feminine. Um, but, uh, yeah, like, a lot of the, a lot of, like, I do a ton of shoulder and chest isolation, um, and I enjoy the occasional, like, big, strong presenting line, um, which I think, again, is, is stereotypically aligned with masculine shapes and movements. I like feet a lot, which I think is gender neutral. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I... I think, I think that perhaps if you asked another person my, um, my assertiveness as a follower might be aligned as masculine, but that would make me mad that that couldn't be a feminine quality. Do you tend to choose masculine movement while leading or feminine movement or neither? Oh. Um, yeah, I, uh, when I lead or follow, I, I move the same way. Like, I, I have to be a little bit more stable as a leader. Um, like, I have to be a little bit more grounded so I can provide balance to my partner more often than I have to provide balance to my partner as a follower, though I do sometimes need to do it as a follower. But either way, like, I do a fishtail the same way. Um, I do a shimmy the same way. I shake my butt an equal amount as a leader and a follower. Um, yeah, same dance, hands are in a different place. In what ways do you express your gender identity while dancing? Do your movements, clothing choices, and or character reflect your gender? I don't even know how to answer that. Like, I don't, I don't feel that I'm, like, the whole masculine feminine thing, it does not, it does not appeal to me as a human in my life at all. Like, I like to wear dresses sometimes and like put flowers in my hair sometimes. I also very much enjoy a good blazer. Um, I like to wrestle with people sometimes. I also enjoy ballet. Like I like, I like things. Um, and I don't think that in my regular life or my dancing life, I really think about putting off a masculine vibe or a feminine vibe. Um, I think that I probably, like, the, the clothing that I choose for movement purposes for dancing tends to be more on the feminine side. Like, I wear more skirts because I like the way they swish. Um, or I like, also pencil skirts give a good shape for seeing body movement. Um, at least, like, the movements that I enjoy doing. Um, so I think... I think that in that respect, I probably give off a more feminine vibe. But if you are close to me and hear me speak or sit down, like I, <laughs> like I'm a very like I'll like flop, I'll like flop when I sit. I'll like you know I'm a I'm a leg spread kind of person. I wear a lot of spanks, so it's appropriate. Um, I burp loudly. I'm very goofy. <laughs> Like, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a mixed bag of qualities uh, in my life. So depending on how close you are to me, I may appear more or less feminine. Okay, what shoes do you wear when you dance? Um, either Keds or very low heels. I tried dancing in higher heels, and it, uh, I can't get grounded enough. Like, I feel, I feel a little too wobbly to do what I like to do. So, um, so if I wear heels, it's, like, an inch and a half or less. Like, one of my pairs of heels is arguably a heel. I mean, it's a, it's a wedge, but, like, it's so little that it's probably a flat. <laughs> are those your new red shoes? No, the red shoes are an inch and a half. I love those. Those are my, it's my first pair of ballroom shoes, and the... The bottom of it, like, lets my foot interact with the floor in an incredible way. It's so nice. So nice. And because of the aforementioned preference for 
foot stuff, like, it just makes it so much more fun. You can, like, yeah, like, the, the tactile sensation of my foot on the floor is, like, even better. It's great. It's great. Nice. Okay. I think I know the answer to this one, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. Do you feel you accentuate your femininity or masculinity for competition or performance? And uh, feel free to speak about particular competitions or performances. Mm-hmm. I, I am glad that you still asked this question um, because, so I've, I've talked a lot about how, you know, as a person, I feel that I have a mix of qualities that are stereotypically viewed as feminine and qualities that are stereotypically viewed as masculine. Um, and I, in competition, like every competition I do, I just try to dance as me. Like I try to dance as me with my heart going out to the audience, but I just dance as me. Um, for performances, I, I do take on different characters, and, um, and the way I view acting is, um, is the way that I wish I could remember whose, whose description this is, but um, acting is like you have a mixing board of, of qualities of you as a person, and you're dialing those qualities up or down, but it's still you. It's just different qualities are highlighted. And... Um, and for different performances, um, I've had those qualities dialed in different ways. Um, and two performances that I think are relevant here are um, Anna Lee, which um, I particularly wanted to show strong feminine movement. Feminine movement. Strong movement from a female without being a man or dressing in pants. Um, that's what I want. That's what I wanted to do for that performance. Um, so I didn't think about, yeah, I didn't think about being feminine per se, but I, I thought about moving as myself and moving as a woman and definitely presenting myself as a woman, but having strong, um, and often aggressive, uh, actually several times aggressive movements. Um, because, I wanted, again, I wanted to show that you can, that you can be feminine and strong at the same time. Those are not opposing characteristics. Um, so I think that's one relevant performance. And then uh, my most recent solo performance uh, to Blue Midnight by Little Walter, um, I did not, I did not intend for it to be a masculine movement piece. Um, but I had people say, oh, it's really interesting to see you do a masculine movement piece. Um, what, what I wanted to do for the piece was be like a, just like a drunken jokester, like a, like a puck, you know, uh, or, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the Commedia, the Commedia dell'arte, uh, character, but there's a character who's like, he walks around, he's really like, yay, like he's really like pelvis forward, and like kind of like, he's like a little creepy, but like mischievous. So like for the performance, I wanted to be like the mischievous drunk. And I think that the, the boyishness in my personality is like, that's, that's the part of me that is mischievous, is like the boyishness part. Um, and so I think that's, that's what brought out the, the like masculine movement in the piece, but it was not my intention to do masculine movement with Blue Midnight. What do you think about female dancers accentuating either femininity or masculinity for competition or performance? Um, I think, um, like, like I said before, like if they're not doing the aping thing, like if they're not like, now I'm a man, like if they're moving in a way that's natural, then I think that's great. Um, I think the thing that I dislike, that I dislike when I see uh, other people doing is not like moving more femininely or moving more masculinely. It's when they're like, let me like show you my butt in a really like way, like <laughs> like if they're like, yeah, that's my butt. <laughs> like if it's really if it's really sexual, yeah, if it's really sexual and not just like not like I'm proud of the way my body moves. Like, I, yeah, like if it's, if it's overly sexual from from men or women, but I do see it 
more, I think, from women. When I see men do stuff like that, usually they're, like, trying to be funny. Like, they're trying to laugh about it. Um, but, yeah, I... <clears throat> I think, again, like, if you move, if you move the way that you move, um, and I generally enjoy peop seeing variety out of people, so, like, if they, if they usually are very, like, sharp movement, and they try a little bit more, like, round, smooth stuff, and I haven't seen that from them before, I'm like, that's pretty neat. I like it. Um, but, yeah. Um. Yeah, and I just really don't like it when people, like, ape, ape the other stereotype of a gender. I don't like that at all. Do not like it. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Did you get that? Did you get that? <laughs> I'm going to have to take notes on this next time you're judging. <laughs> yeah. Don't uh, move like a gorilla, Grace. <laughs> I'm going to try my hardest. Like... Like, I make no promises. <laughs> Oh my god, please, please dress as a gorilla for your next competition. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh. This is this is gonna happen. Yep. One day. I'm ready. I'm ready for it. Okay. First place. First place instead of last place. <laughs> oh my god. Alright. Do you believe that age is a factor in how a woman might express their gender on the dance floor? Probably. Probably. Because, I mean, not necessarily, but maybe. Because some people, some people grow up and they have a very strong sense of who they are and who they want to be, um, like, from day one or from day, like, pretty early. But, uh, some people, some people look outside for their identity earlier in life, and when they get older, maybe they get more comfortable being something not, that they didn't get from society. Um, but I don't think that necessarily means that they will express themselves more or less feminine, because some people's, like true self is being a woman and being super feminine. Oh, hey. no. <laughs> yeah, so someone finding their, you know, feeling comfortable expressing them true selves does not necessarily mean, you know, their true self is not a woman who's super feminine or, like, a man who's super masculine. Um, just, like, we might, like, when we're younger, we might gravitate towards more stereotypical behavior just because we think that's what we're supposed to do. Can you tell me a little bit more about the follower's role, the follower's voice that you've mentioned previously? In blues uh, dancing specifically? I'm sorry, um, say it. In blues dancing specifically? Like the the role of the follow, what, what, what that entails and how that might be different from other dances. Yeah, um, I was actually having a fan freaking tastic uh, conversation or set of conversations over this past weekend with Abigail Browning and Adam Steen, who are Balboa dancers. Um, and since you mentioned blues dancing as opposed to other dances, um, I think they're the way that they dance Balboa and the way that I dance Bal I dance blues. Um, actually, the follower the follower and leader role is very similar. Um, the follower still makes lots of choices, not only about individual movement, but um, if the leader is, if the leader knows how to pay attention to details and create space, but also retain some structure, then the follower can affect all sorts of things. The follower can affect direction, can affect energy, can affect rhythm, can affect all sorts of things um, that people might not typically think are the followers domain. For, for me, it, um, it does depend a lot on the partner, like how much I'll express. Um, so I talked a little bit about this when I was talking about dancing with different levels of dancer. So if I'm dancing with the beginner, um, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna play with as many aspects of the dance because I won't be able to follow what they're leading, um, and, and control those aspects because they don't know how to respond. They only know how to give signals out. Um, but leaders who 
who have an attention to detail um, and know how to, uh, sort of what I said, know how, how to provide uh, structure and a place to be, but also know when I'm making a choice to be in a place that was not like something they directly told me to do. If they know how to respond to that and then use that, then um, I have pretty much, I can, I can do whatever I want. It's great. And not in a way that like they have stopped leading and that I have started leading. Like I'm still in the follower role. We're both listening to each other. Um, but I can do whatever I want. Like particularly with Sean, like Sean's maybe one of the best examples. And I, I'll like, I'll like mess. We'll both mess with each other in that way too. Like, like, Oh yeah. Like what if I do this thing? Like it's, it's really fun. It's really fun. Um, a difficulty for me has actually been defining following. Defining leading was easier. I tried this. I tried to do this with a couple different people. I tried to do it with Andrew Smith and uh, Dan Rupsch and I have been talking about it a little bit too. But um, the leader definitely like causes causes their partner's body to move in space. But sometimes the follower can do that too. Like basically for me, following is a challenge. Like I would like, I would, I hesitate to do this because this is probably going to be in public, but like I would love to issue a challenge for people to me uh, to, to say something that I can't do as a follower. And I would like to try to find a way to do that as a follower, like something that I can't affect. Um, but again, it does depend on the leader. So like if it's a beginner with a beginner leader, like there's definitely stuff I can't do. But with a partner, with a partner of a certain level, I feel like I could do anything. Like it's like a fun puzzle. Like what happens if I go here? Like, oh, can I still like do this? Like if you get the timing right and you like project what you want to do right and you're like matching your frame in the correct way and like you're attentive to how your leader is reacting to the changes you make as you're making them, like you can still be following and do a lot of crazy junk. <laughs> and sometimes it goes wrong and I just like don't follow, but like that's fine. That's fine. It's, you know, you experiment and like the leader understands. As long as like your whole dance isn't like that, then, you know, you mess, like people mess up, do, you, like you do what you didn't mean to do all the time. It's fine. <laughs> and do you have any final thoughts on gender and blues dancing or kind of anything we've talked about or not talked about? I think I've soapboxed all my soapboxes. I think nice. I did them. Nice. So in summary, booty shaking, no gorillas. <laughs> um, don't ask me to teach feminine movement classes if you don't want me to, like, get all gender politics on your class. Um, ooh, mmm, hmm. Um, I do have a related soapbox. Um, switch dancing? Role switching. Um, I believe that I believe that you first posted this on Facebook, but I totally agree with this. Um, I think that when you are when you're forced <clears throat> when you're forced to learn both roles, um, it makes it it can create a false dichotomy between leading being I'm in charge of all of the things and following being I'm super passive and you just kind of move me around the floor. Uh, and I think that sucks because when you're really good at a role, both leaders and followers like do, uh, do expressing and listening, like both do initiating and responding. And I think that that is one of my favorite parts of partner dance. Like if I had to, choose between only leading, like only being in charge of all the things and moving my partner around the floor and only being passive and being moved around, I would not partner dance. That would be, that would be such a lame time. 
for me, for me personally. Um, so that's kind of related. Um, and I see absolutely nothing wrong with uh, trying out leading and trying out following if you don't know uh, whether you want to do one or the other. I think that's a great idea um, because I do think that the reason most women follow and the reason most men lead is because you're like, well, I guess this is what I'm supposed to do. Like you just like you just don't know. You don't know. Um, so I think that part of it's really good. Um, <clears throat> but I think that, and I think that it's great for people to learn both roles if they feel like they might like that, but I don't think it should be mandatory either. Um, because I don't like people telling me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will never tell you that you need to learn both roles in a class. More Thank notes, you. more notes for me. Yeah. So I mean, if I, I guess if I take your class, I've agreed to do what you tell me for at least that hour. Oh, okay. But I can't, like, issue a mandate across Julie Brown's... Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you're, and if you've hired me and you're paying me, you can tell me what to do for the parts that you're paying me to do. <laughs> so you could say that I had to teach both roles, which I don't have a problem doing. I just have to augment my material to allow time to sufficiently learn both skills in a class, which means uh, I can't get through as much material, either in depth or breadth, because uh, you just got to have more practice time for that. But, yeah. But, yeah. I, uh, I'm fine with people putting their ideas out there. Just don't make me do it. Just don't make me do it. Unless you're paying me, and then I'll do it in the way that I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, some great takeaways from this. Yeah. For sure. Yep. <laughs> the gorillas out. 